Dr. Mindy Pels. Welcome to Roll With The Punches. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I am excited to have you. You know, it's it's funny. I just had to practice your name then, and it's ridiculous that I have to practice names that really they phonetic, they're said phonetically. They don't look confusing, but I have to check because you would be surprised at how easily I can butcher the simplest names. <laughs> oh, I, you know what? It's so funny you say that because I'm the same way. And <laughs> and for years, my staff in my clinic they used to always tease me. They're like, "You're not saying the person's name right." And I don't know if it was how my brain worked. I'm like, I don't know. You'll have to tell me like ten times, and I'll figure it out. <laughs> so you're in you're in the proper company today. To, you can ask me as many times as you want. <laughs> good, good. You know where I really struggle? Because I have so many international guests. If someone, so I've, I had a, uh, I remember an Irish guest on and obviously really heavy Irish accent and you're like, oh, how do I pronounce your name? And then they say it and you think, yeah, but when I say it, do I actually say it like that? Or then do I sound silly because I'm adding an Irish accent to the pronunciation? It's like, oh you- my gosh. Like, can you actually go get an Australian to come and say that for me so I know <laughs> that I don't sound ridiculous? <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's, fun. it's funny when you think about ask, uh, accents that we're all speaking the same language, but when you have a different accent, it's really hard. Like, I, I mean, I struggle sometimes with a really thick Irish accent yeah. and, and even a thick English-British accent, and I'm like, I know you're speaking English, <laughs> And why can't my brain like understand this? Uh, It's really fascinating how the accent accent makes a difference. Do you know what else is fascinating and a bit weird with me is I can, it's almost like I, I don't, I don't hear the accent first. So I'll speak to a lot of international guests and accents are, are fairly like it's most people can go, oh, that person's clearly English or that person's clearly Mm. Californian or clearly Irish. Whereas I mean, I've been known to genuinely ask someone, are you from Australia? And they're just like, have you, can you hear me? Do yeah, I just sound like I'm from Australia? I'm like, oh, actually you do. It's like when they're in front of me, when I listen back, I'll be like, oh, I love that accent of theirs. It's so, you know, it sounds like this person. But when I'm in the conversation, it's the, it almost doesn't hit my radar. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I surely, surely from a neuroscience standpoint, I'm like, there's got to be a part of the brain that translates language, specifically accents and like helps your brain integrate it. So it'd be interesting to know what part of the brain does that. It might be the one to work on. Yeah. And I remember when I was, I was looking at voiceovers a little bit, cause I had Siri, the voice of Siri, um, yeah. on the show. And so then I was I was really interested in doing a lot of Googling around, oh, that's a, how interesting this voiceover thing. And that they, and even actors have to learn accents. And I was like, oh, that's hard. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay, wait, You, I want to go back up. You had the voice of Siri. Yeah, I had the, uh, the in- Australian voice of Siri. And you know the best part that I remember her saying? I was like, do you use Siri? Do you, uh, Siri <gasps> and all of the GPS. So the GPS in your car, Tom, Tom, Navman. She does those voices and she goes, yeah, but when she talks to Siri, she goes, Siri doesn't understand my voice. (laughs) (laughs) That talk about a bummer. Yeah. And this is what we'll, we'll move on to the intended topic soon because I want to hit it. But when I, what was funny was like I said to you before, I had this conversation with her. I got her to throw out some of the, the lines so I could have a laugh. But when I edited it after the conversation, I messaged her and I said, you know what's really weird? Now I hear Siri in your natural voice. I hear it like it's a person I know and mm. I have this relationship that I that I wasn't hearing as strongly when I was in the conversation when she was in front of me. Isn't that interesting? That is so weird. That yeah. is so weird. Yeah. My I, don't know if, I don't know if my internet's uh, cutting out, but I'm going to close the and see if we can get a better connection here. I think it's on my end. So... I just got a message on mine to say I've got an unstable internet. So let me stream as well so that we are. I mean, it is, if you think about it, we are different parts of the world having a conversation. And it's kind of funny. We get so used to technology working for us that when it doesn't work, it's hard to believe. We're pretty lucky. I'm just going to jump internet. So there may be a little bit of a glitch, I reckon. Bear with me.
All right, that should keep us happy. Cool. Awesome. Okay, let's get into all of your wisdom because this is a topic I love, I'm fascinated by. I've spent countless, countless, countless hours Googling and asking the same questions from different angles and looking again and looking at YouTube videos and and it's interesting. And I deliberately sought out yourself to have this conversation with me because I believe, and you might correct me, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm just being biased, but I believe that a lot of the the information and research and science is from men for men yes, and yeah. doesn't take into account the complexities of yeah. us complex little creatures <laughs> that we are. <laughs> yes, I call them our superpowers. You know, it really is true that I don't want to say we're delicate because at certain times of the month, we are delicate. But uh, we also have more hormones coming and going. And so in everything, everything we do from working out to fasting, to eating, to managing stress, to our -hmm. social calendar, it all needs to be, our hormones need to be considered. And I would absolutely agree with you. Part of why I am speaking out is I am, I just got exhausted with men saying, well, women shouldn't fast or women need to fast differently, but then they don't say why or how, and the world still sees them as the, as the top authorities. So it just, I just got tired of it and I needed to get, get the message out to the world that women need to fast differently. I love it. When did you first get interested in the topic? Was it was it the first thing or did you kind of start looking at other things and then wind up here? It's a, so such a good question. It, you know, it's like fasting found me. And basically what happened was when I turned 40, I, I'm athletic as well. I was a competitive tennis player. I love to work out. Uh, I ate really healthy. Like literally at 40, I was like, there's nothing that I can improve upon in my lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And by 43, I was not sleeping. I was gaining weight. I was depressed. I had some anxiety. Like I felt like my whole world had been flipped upside down and I hadn't done anything different. Nothing mm-hmm. had, had changed. So I really went to go put my own uh, health puzzle back together. And about that time, this was about 10 years ago, about that time we started fasting was emerging. Dr. Um, Osumi's research out of Japan about autophagy was showing up. Um, We had some of Walter Longo's studies about three-day water fasts. So I just started dabbling in it and experimenting in myself. And it was like a miracle cure. It was like something as simple as skipping breakfast. Breakfast was definitely my most favorite meal of the day. Mm -hmm. And so just skipping breakfast changed my energy, changed my mental clarity, had me dropping weight. I found I didn't need to exercise as much. I I actually changed the whole way I looked at exercise. It wasn't a tool for weight loss anymore. It was more of a mental health tool. Mm -hmm. And all of that changed in a matter of a month or two. And I was hooked at that point. I'm like, I've got, what's the science behind this? I got to understand this. So that's where I sort of started and my journey has continued since then. I love this. I love this. This is, this is what I do. I've, I've been, I'm a big fan of intermittent fasting. I'm a big fan of kind of the, the 16, eight, but I am often fairly flexible in it and mainly due to my always changing schedule. So I do. And, you know, maybe by the end of this conversation, I'll have a different idea about it. But here's what I tend to do. And I reckon a lot of women or men, anyone do do is I would always Google the same question to different times, looking for the answer that suited me at the time or oh, you, always you, reinforcing, always double. It's like, why am I sometimes? Why am I looking for the answer to this when I already know it? And it can often be around, well, I guess some of the things the, the, the thing that really interests me is the autophagy mm-hmm. um, and I guess understanding when that kicks in. So I guess one of the things I'd love you to share about today is when, what is that for the people that are going, the autophagy? Um, <laughs> what is it? Yeah. What does it do yeah. to our body? And when are we accessing, when it, like how long does it take to access that? How often should we access it if that is, and yeah, what what is the purpose of that? 
Yeah. So I think the concept of autophagy, Dr. Osumi was the one, he's a Japanese researcher that really brought it to the forefront. And he actually won a Nobel Prize in medicine and physiology in 2015 for the concept called autophagy in relation to the absence of food. Mm. And so that you, I mean, if you're hearing this for the first time, you're like, why haven't I heard about autophagy? It's fair. It, we haven't been talking about it for decades and decades. It's only within the last decade that we are starting to see the evidence of how powerful autophagy is. Wow. Yeah. So it's fairly new. So the best way I can explain autophagy, and, and I think this is what I love the most about teaching fasting is that we are designed in the most powerful computer that exists on the planet. So you can call it a machine, you can call it a computer, but you have more wisdom inside every single mm -hmm. cell mm -hmm. in your body than all the, every, every single piece of advice on the internet. Like we are so well designed, yet we know so little about what how to take amazing care of these cells that make up our body. Mm. So what, what Dr. Osumi's work did that just really blew our minds is he was the first to show when we go without food, we don't perish. And I, I really want to, if you're not fasting, like I want to point that out. When you go without food temporarily, you don't die, you don't get sicker, you actually tap into a healing power that if that exists within these cells that you can't get with any medication, you can't get with a supplement, you can't, you can get it a little bit with exercise, a little bit with sleep, but it is best tapped into by avoiding food for a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. And the research is now showing 17 hours without food, you stimulate autophagy, it turns on. And what autophagy is, is where the intelligence inside the cell goes, you know what? No food's coming. I better become a better cell. So it turns within and it looks at all the cellular parts and it says, hey, endoplasmic reticulum, you're broken. Like I need to clean you up. Or there's a virus inside the, inside the cell and it's destroying the cell. I need to kill that virus. Or, hey, there's thousands of mitochondria inside this cell and they're not making enough ATP for energy. Hey, mitochondria, you need to clean up your act and you need to become more efficient. So you literally autophagy, they, it stands for self-eating, but what it means is that you have triggered an internal repair mechanism within the side the cell that is really impossible to get to this degree without fasting. Mm, I love that. So if somebody, if somebody is more athletic, so, so let's say back when I was competing in boxing and I first started fasting, I'm already training a lot and eating well and nutrition and all that jazz. And then I start fasting. Is it fair to say that in those circumstances, you can reach that state at faster? Probably. Yeah. In fact, that's, this, it's a really good question. We've uh, a lot of us in the fasting movement have really talked about, well, what if you're fasting a lot? Are you getting to autophagy quicker? And then what I heard from what you said is, well, what if I'm fat work out in a, I, I think you said in a fasted state. Yeah. Um, so, you know, exercise, you can stimulate autophagy. It's not as deep as, as fasting, but if you combine it with fasting, yeah. Now you've got yourself an incredible cellular repair system going on that you haven't spent a dime on. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. All right. So let's keep on that topic a little bit, but female specific. So is the 16-8, what's your stance on the 16-8 for women? Yeah. So it's 16-8 for, if you're not familiar with fasting is 16 hours of fasting, eight hours of eating. So your eating window is compressed into eight hours. What we know about this type of fasting is that you literally become metabolically immune from any bad diet. So if you want to eat at fast food all day long and you don't want to ever change your diet and you do 16, eight, 
you are going to find that you don't gain weight. Your hemoglobin A1C won't go up. Your inflammatory markers don't go up. Some of your cardiovascular markers don't go, will, will stay normal. Like everything that gets destroyed with that diet, you become immune from, which is amazing. Let's just start there. And I'm not advocating for poor eating. I'm just saying that that's the power of the 16-8. Now, for women, it's a little different. So w- w- the first thing I would say, at certain times of your cycle, 16-8 is great. And those are usually the first 10 days when you first start bleeding. You can go, you can do a three-day water fast. You can do 16-8. You can do a 24-hour fast. Uh, one meal a day is a really popular style of fasting where you fast all day and you just eat at night. Um, those are going to be great within the first 10 days. Mm-hmm. When you move into the ovulation window, which is around day 11 to day 15, at that point, 16 8 should be okay, but you actually do not want to stimulate a lot of autophagy in the ovulation window. And le- this is tricky. Let me tell you why. What happens and during ovulation is you have the most amount of estrogen that you will ever get in that month. You have the most amount of testosterone that you will ever get in this five-day window, and you have a little bit of progesterone. When these hormones come surging in, a lot of times they cause, and as they increase, they cause a release of toxins from your tissues. So sometimes it can be the environmental toxins we are all dealing with, like plastics and glyphosate. Uh, Sometimes it's heavy metals. But if you are stimulating autophagy, and you have this toxic dump from the hormonal surge, you're going to feel pretty yucky in ovulation. You're going to, you might have a headache, you might have brain fog, you might have a rash, like you are going to definitely suffer. Mm. So if you know your toxic load is high, I don't recommend going more than 15 hours, 16 might work. But the minute we get into 17 hours during ovulation, Mm, now you risk, uh, you know, the keto rash, you, you risk, or the keto flu, you risk more detox symptoms mm. after. Isn't that interesting? It's yeah. that one is that one. I've just, we've, we've test, by the way, we've tested these on hundreds of thousands of women. Um, we have played with these principles and it's really interesting to see the trends. And that's one of them. The more toxic a woman is, the less she should fast during that ovulation window. And then the question is, how do you know how toxic you are? That's a, that's a whole other discussion. Um, but then outside of ovulation, we have a four-day window, day 16 to about day 19, where our hormones dip, and we can go back into some longer fasts. You can stimulate autophagy, no problem. And then once you hit day 19, what ends up happening is you are trying to make progesterone. And you need progesterone to be able to shed the uterine lining. So if you are fasting, because fasting will spike cortisol temporarily. Exercise spikes cortisol temporarily. But anytime cortisol goes up, progesterone goes down. So you will tank progesterone, and then all of a sudden you'll start losing your periods. You'll start feeling anxious. Uh, Sometimes we've seen a lot of women who start losing hair when they're fasting. um, And it's just because they're not minding that week before their cycle. So when we look at a a woman who has a cycle, there's a classic example of front half of the cycle. You can go big ovulation. We want to be moderate. You have a couple of days where you go big again, and then you want to shut it down for a week until you start bleeding. This is the most brilliant information I have ever heard on this. Like that, (laughs) it makes so much sense. And is this why there tends to be a kind of a blanket statement that women post menopause are good to go on fasting. Yeah. Yes. Because that of that that fluctuation has yeah. disappeared. Yeah, but there but there's some nuance on that too because what I discovered was that so many postmenopausal women still have menopausal symptoms. So they're they're still getting hot flashes. They can't lose the weight that they gained as they were going through the perimenopausal years. Um, they're still anxious and depressed. Their hair and their skin, still not what they want it to be. Mm -hmm. And yes, you're never getting those hormones back. That's naturally supposed to decline. 
but you still need to come up with that same kind of variation where you go into some longer fasts and then some shorter fasts and then longer. So we've, I've come up with a 30 day, what I call a 30 day reset for, for everybody, but also post uh, menopausal women where you could just plug and play and go through the changes that you need to make. And usually within 30 to 90 days, postmenopausal women, those symptoms will be gone. This is great. So I had, there was a conversation with somebody recently and that I was listening to, and I think it was around um, keto, which I don't know a lot about. I was listening to this and it was taught, they were talking, they made mention of, and this caught my attention, they made mention of women start fasting and they, and we feel amazing for the first 10 days or whatever. And then we tank and it's because, and, but if we were to, you know, have what the MTCT oil or fat in our coffee or have, have some fat during that window, we're still reaching autophagy, I believe. I don't know if you can clarify this, yep. uh, but it, but it's, it is protecting those hormones. Is that more potentially more to do with our cycle that we're feeling that tanked? Yeah, it's, it, it has everything to do with the cycle. So this is, and MCT oil is good and we can talk about it, but it's not going to be the cure for your hormones. It's, if you look at, let's just look at estrogen and progesterone. Mm. Um, what I always say about them is they may be sisters and they may come from the same family. They may even look very similar but how their personalities are, are dramatically different. Mm. So estrogen loves low carb. Estrogen loves fasting. Estrogen loves when you bring insulin down. In fact, if you don't bring insulin down, you're going to end up with estrogen dominance and, or you're going to end up with challenges with ovulation because you might not have enough estrogen. So in order to keep estrogen in check, we need to keep insulin in check. Cortisol, on the other hand, doesn't care so much about insulin. And I mean, I'm sorry, progesterone doesn't care so much about insulin. In fact, progesterone would like you to keep glucose a little higher. The week before our period, we're actually more insulin resistant. We are biologically made to be more insulin resistant because in order to make progesterone, we've got to bring glucose and insulin up. Is this what we binge? Exactly. By we, I mean I. <laughs> yeah, no, me, yeah, me too. No, this is like, literally, this was like, when I started to unpack this, I'm like, oh my God, women need to know this because yeah. we villainize ourselves. We're like, why am I craving carbs? We want to just sit on the couch and like binge out on a Netflix series and like eat a bunch of carbs. Mm. And then we beat ourselves up. But what we don't realize is we're biologically made to raise glucose and chill the F out because cortisol, when cortisol goes up, then now progesterone goes down. So for progesterone, we need glucose a little higher. We need insulin a little higher and we need to keep cortisol down. Mm, This is the best. It's the best. (laughs) Crazy, right? Um, You mentioned now I've got to ask this for Aaron. I've got a few questions. So as they pop up, I might ask them and then we'll check at the end that I've answered them all. Erin was interested in, she's a friend of mine, and shout out to you, Erin, because it sounds like we are still doing cookies, <laughs> guilt-free <laughs> well, cookies. Yes, I was going to say quality ingredients, quality ingredients. Of course, sure. of <laughs> course. Um, so she's ta- So her question was, because we ta- I was talking a bit to her about fasting recently, she's um, working around some health uh, things and fasting is something that came across as being worthwhile for her. However, she had that experience with feeling great at first and then feeling a bit tanked. She wanted to know, um, is she good to fast through the week and then just take the weekends off? Is there, is that okay? Or should she follow more, follow that cycle? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's something called five, two, um, fasting where five days a week, you fast two days a week. You don't do anything. Yeah. Great. Great for men, not as great for women. And this is why Mm. I really encourage women to map their cycle. Like just take those first two 10 days and really go in and fast deeply and then ovulation mellow out a little bit. Then you can go deep again and then enjoy your cookies and your couch and don't fast that week before. So I would rather if, you know, I would rather have her follow a 30 day schedule than a week schedule. 
I love that. And her other question was, "What is? The, you might not know the answer to this, what is the cure for menopausal melting? Uh, 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 mind melting, like mood melting. Well, I think like the oh, uh, like hot, yeah, yeah hot, hot Okay, so actually, it there is a there is a legitimate um, reason that can be helped. So let's start off with this: menopausal women don't have to have hot flashes. It's not like it comes with the menopausal territory. So when you have high hot flashes, what's happening is there's a sudden drop in estrogen. And as estrogen declines quickly, what it does is it triggers the hypothalamus to turn up the heat. So think of it, next time you have a hot flash, what I want you to think of is, oh my gosh, my estrogen just tanked. And so, okay, let's go back to our principles. What does estrogen want? Estrogen wants you to fast and estrogen wants you to not eat the cookies. Estrogen wants you to bring carbs down. The other thing that estrogen wants is really wants you to eat a lot of greens because we have a whole set of bacteria in our gut that break estrogen down. So use your hot flash as an indication as to you need more fasting, you need more keto, you need more more gut repair. Oh, bloody love this. You know, it just it's so relevant to what you said before in terms of we are already built with the most intelligent, wisdom fueled body, but until when then we use this what we think is intelligence, but it's our crazy little mind that just overpowers all of the sense. But you know, once we, we understand now, once we know what to look for, we can get the right answers instead of just losing our shit over every reaction our body has to something. So that's, this is awesome. Yeah. Um, and, and to, just to your point on that, I mean, the, the, I have um, the next book that I have coming out is called fast, like a girl, and it will come out in December at the end of this year. Thank you. And so, um, but what, what, why I want to put the book out is I think too many women have not been taught what we're talking about. And so we villainize our carb cravings. We villainize the fact that we can't get off the couch and go work out. We villainize the hot flashes, women going through menopause. Why can't I think straight? Why am I depressed? Why am I anxious? And the answers were given by the medical community is it's just menopause. It's you're just hormonal. And what I want women to know is we are ridiculously powerful. These hormones make us incredibly mentally and physically and emotionally powerful. We just have not, haven't been taught how to use them. It's almost like we've been given like a wizard's wand and we weren't taught how to use it. So we're, we keep either putting it down or we're using it wrong. Mm. You know, one thing that interested me, I've at a couple of times throughout life spent a couple of years at a time competing in boxing. Um, one of those was in 2019 and never in any of that time was training for your cycle or even any awareness that there's different times throughout my cycle. So here we are in a peak performance sport where the one percenters matter. Every, you know, the, your, the speed of your cognition and reactions matters. The management of your emotions matters. Everything matters to the nth degree. Yet yeah. there is <laughs> zero information like... <laughs> You can't be a hundred grams over the weight division, Mm. yet you can step in there on a particular day of your cycle and be 10% weaker or whatever the percentage you could be, you know, and and 10% less efficient and effective. And it's that blew my mind realizing that and going, oh, there was no awareness on that for me as an athlete. Well, you know what, if you even think about that, so ovulation window we have the most amount of estrogen during that time. Estrogen actually makes our ligaments very pliable and flexible. So if you're doing a lot of quick workouts, like if you were doing like boxing, what's going to happen and it's real quick, you're more prone to injury because Mm. your ligaments are going to be a little more loose during that time. But the other weird thing about that time is testosterone will help you build muscle like nobody's business. So if during ovulation, you used all that testosterone you were given and started increasing weights, heavy weights during that time, you could really grow muscle quicker. 
but we've got both those hormones together. So you're going to have to do slow weightlifting. You can't do things really quick because you mm -hmm. don't want to pull on the ligaments, but yet you want to build the muscle. That's the level of sophistication we need to get to for women. I love that. And I had two questions from people about that, right? So these people I know are into, um, from memory, I think they're doing some body bodybuilding or body competitions and stuff. If not, they're training in, in that way and their questions are around, will fasting cause muscle loss and what is the optimal length to prevent this? And the other body person asked a similar thing. Um, a question about female fasting and training during or just before the end of a fast, one, an answer for cardio and an answer for lifting heavy shit. So if you can talk a little bit clearly around yeah. direction for them, that'd be great. Oh my God. You, I love the questions your audience asks. This is, <laughs> Me this, too. is really, <laughs> this is awesome. Um, okay. So let's start with the first, okay. The, I heard training. What was the first one? You, you, I think you packed a couple of questions in there. Yeah, I'd always do that. I'm terrible for that. Um, well, the first question was how long should you fast for resetting your gut, which I didn't mention before. Okay. And also, will fasting cause muscle loss? Uh, yes. And yes. what is the optimal length to prevent? Okay, it? that was the one I wanted to make sure I answered because um, this is a huge myth that is not being uh, taught properly. Here's what happens when you go into autophagy. You are asking, outside of this cellular repair system, you are asking your body to release stored sugar. And there are three places that it releases this from your fat cells, your liver cells, and your muscles. And it usually does it in the order of fat first, muscle second, liver third. Liver's the hardest to go after. Hmm. So people, as they, if they're athletic and they go into a workout in a fasted state, you've now double stacked that, that effect of releasing stored sugar. You're asking your muscles to use sugar to perform and you're in a fasted state where blood sugar is going down. So now your body's got to release even more stored sugar. Mm. In that process, if you were to do a bicep measurement, you would probably see, yes, post-workout, that appeared to break muscle down, but in a good way. So mm. what you've got to do is once go into your workout in a fasted state, have your killer workout and then go home immediately and power up on protein. Specifically 30 grams of a meat of protein will trigger an amino acid sensor inside your muscles that stimulates something called mTOR, which will build the muscle stronger. So look at working out in a fasted state as like a kitchen remodel. You're going in and you're like taking, you're gutting out everything that's not working. Mm. And then you now have the opportunity to put in high quality nutrition to build up the, the proper, you know, in a kitchen, it would be the proper cabinets and the stove and everything like that. Mm -hmm. So, but fasting got a really bad rap for breaking muscle down. And it's like one of my pet peeves because yes, it's supposed to break muscle down temporarily. Mm. But if you want to build muscle, the greatest hack in the whole world is fasted workout, go and lift a bunch of weights and then power up on protein, make sure it's at least 30 grams and you'll grow, you'll grow muscle like you've never seen. Oof, brilliant. One question I've got around that as well is what about performance in terms of strength? Are we, when we do strength training, so that's, so you've got people who are just wanting uh, the physiological outcome. And then you've got performance. So when I'm going into a fasted training session with weights, am I going to perform as well? Or if I'm training for competition in performance, should I train fast as it and compete not fasted or thoughts yeah. around that? Yeah. So let me give you one of my favorite uh, little tricks with workouts and fasting. Um, if let's say Saturday is the, your, is a big day for you, whether you're going to going to do, let's say you're either know you're going to power up your weights, you're going to do more, or maybe you're in a competition. The greatest thing you can do is Monday through Thursday, go into some deeper fasts. And then, so 17 hours, stimulate autophagy. And then when you eat a meal, make sure you're getting that protein amount. You're getting a good amount of protein. Then on Friday, 
you're actually not going to fast much. If you want to do 13 hours, you can, but on Friday, you're going to do what we call protein cycling. Every two to three hours, you're going to have 20 grams, 30 grams of protein, somewhere in there every two to three hours up until you get to about 150 grams of protein. What that does is you are locked and loaded with mTOR and amino acids that will make Saturday's performance, whatever it is, give you like superhuman strength. So you, you go into Saturday's competition, your muscles are locked and loaded because you cleaned out the, all the stuff that wasn't working Monday through Thursday. You gave it an amino acid burst on Friday and now Saturday, it is ready to perform for you. You can do whatever pre-competition workout works best for you, but then you go in, you do the tough workout, you do the competition, whatever recovery meal, usually I tell people protein works. And then on Sunday, go back to the protein cycling because you've just exhausted those muscles. So we need to replenish it with amino acids. So go back every two to three hours, you're doing 30 grams of protein, do that up to 150. You can fast if you want or not, it's up to you. And then Monday through Thursday, head down. We're back into our fasted state. We're going back into the state of autophagy so that we make sure we're keeping any extra sugar, any parts of, of muscles that aren't working well, any muscle fibers that aren't great. We're like cleaning house. Mm -hmm. And then th Thursday Sat or Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it's like we're, we're powering up. And it, it, we've had, I've had like, 56, and this works for men and women. I've had like 56 year old men who are Spartan racers. I don't know if you all have Spartan racing. Yes. Bio. Yep. Okay. They're like, they, they like shave like five, 10 t minutes off their time by doing that little hack. Wow. That's awesome. Do BCAAs break a fast? It, it, so it depends on who you ask. Um, <laughs> it's, I would say they break autophagy. Yeah. So you won't be in autophagy but you may still be in ketosis. Right. Yep. So I don't, I don't know if you need me to explain that because that can get confusing. For well, people. maybe explain it. I get it, but maybe explain it for, for the listeners. Yeah. So ketosis, all that is, is it's showing that your body's burning energy from fat as opposed yeah. from the glucose you bring in. Yeah. Ketones are great. They're wonderful. They, they, they're also energizing. They, there's so many reasons to love ketones. Um, if you do the BCAAs or you do collagen powder, or anything like that in your fasted window, you typically won't pull yourself out of ketosis, but you will pull yourself out of autophagy. And autophagy yeah. is more repair. Ketosis is more a fat burning state. And that would be a similar result if you were to put the, the oil or fat in, your co in, in black coffee, wouldn't it? That's right. And that's why they do the oil in the coffee is to get you over to this fat adapted place. And in a performance state, you know, you, your listeners will have to play with this, but what's really interesting is like the brain uses 50% glucose, 50% ketones. So if you're never getting into ketosis, you're, you're lacking 50% of the fuel for the brain. If Ooh. we go and we look at the little mitochondria of the cell that gives you ATP, gives you energy, same thing. We've got, it needs glucose and it needs ketones to be able to do work its magic. So we've got to learn how to go in and out of sugar burner, fat burner, sugar burner, fat burner, so that you can access both of those incredible resources for your brain and for your mitochondria. Wow. I remember back in 2014 and 15, I would say that unbeknownst to myself at the time, I was operating quite heavily in a more a fat burning state. Um, and I, because I seem to have naturally, when I eat healthy, I, I, because I'm not a real, I don't eat pasta or a lot of rice or a lot of carby carbs, like my carbs would basically be sweet potato and veggies. And for the amount of training I was doing, I look at that and go, I would, would probably sh could have, or should have maybe perhaps <laughs> had more carbs to help me perform. But I remember a time where I used to make these bliss balls at home, healthy bliss balls, of course, but bliss balls, right? So they're loaded with dates. So they're loaded with carbs. And it was really funny because I would make them and then I binge on them because I'm not an adult when it comes to having things <laughs> in any great portion. So I'd make them and I'd binge on them. And there was a couple of times I'd, I'd make a batch in the morning and I'd have a whole bunch of them. I was like, oh, goodness me. And then I'd go to a boxing class. But with that fuel in my system, and I did it, it after I'd done it a few times and had the same result, I was like, you know, I 
performed like a weapon in those classes. My energy was just next level and my performance, and it was so fun. And then after all, I was like, every time I do that, it's like I load up on these carbs. I don't know, maybe it was in my head or maybe there was something to it, but it was like something that I noticed and went, ah, maybe I'm not eating enough carbs for the type of training I'm doing, perhaps. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a good question. And the thing to realize is that carbs are short energy. They're short-lived energy. So I don't know how long that workout was, but if you're going to go a half hour and you want to go really quick bursts, then carbs will be really good. Mm. But if you're going to last any longer than a half hour, you need some protein as well to be able Mm. to create more endurance. So yeah. So I I don't know how how long was that workout? Well, they were normally an hour, um, but they were protein balls as well. So they had protein Ah, as well. So yeah, but I found that, and I guess that the the style of eating really matched the way that my fitness panned out. Cause as a, as a boxer, like we train high intensity, but my training sessions were long and my strength in the boxing ring was always that, that high level of intensity, the endurance I had with it. And mm-hmm. I never tanked out. Like I would tend to be able to maintain this really high level beyond other opponents, mm-hmm. which yeah. I feel is kind of, yeah, I don't know, maybe. What was the, the other question? Yeah, like a protein ball. Like if you did like a- uh, 10. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, right, or 10. Uh, I have a good friend, uh, his name is Bill Schindler, and he wrote a book called uh, Eat Like a Human. And he has these, he's a big fan of insects for protein, which is a whole nother discussion. Yeah, right. So, but he has a product, his company is Modern Stone Age Kitchen, and he has a, a, a cricket ball or a cricket bomb. And oh, it wow. sounds very much like what you just said. It was crickets, dates, coconut, a little bit of honey. Oh my gosh. That was like, that's like the perfect scenario pre-workout because crickets have so much protein in them. And you combine that with the glucose of the dates and the honey. And it, yeah, they, it's amazing. I don't think he'll, he's like a little small, small mom and pop shop. I'm not sure he sends to Australia, Damn but, it! but you can get his book and make cricket bombs, or I think he called, I think he decided to call it cricket bombs. I love that. Wow. Um, another question I had was around that, and I don't know if other people experience it, but you know, you have this beautiful energy when you're fasting and when you're fasting adapted. So obviously at first you experience a lot of hunger until you kind of get used to that new schedule. But um, I would always find that then when I have my breakfast or that, but I break that fast, it's quite often that I would realize a real level of fatigue it was like oh mm. so we're like Would get you... stuff done get stuff done get oh i'll have my breakfast now and i have probably too big a meal let's be honest yeah i'll have my breakfast yeah. and then i'll be like oh i'm so tired now <laughs> yeah. that's what i was gonna say is what you break it with but yeah. and, and i will tell you that most of us that fast this is our dilemma this is like the faster's dilemma because your brain and your energy is so good in a fasted state. Mm. And once you break the fast, you may know that edge sort of leaves you. And so now you have to, you know, you have to decide. I mean, I did this today. I've been on, on interviews and coaching calls all day. And about noon, I was like, I'm going to need to eat something. And so I ate something. And then the afternoon, I feel like my energy and mental clarity has just gone down. And all I can think now is like, I should have just kept on fasting all throughout the day. So everybody has to find their own fasting groove. But what is so surprising to so many people is that your mental and physical and and emotional state is more heightened in the fasting window. And that feels very counterintuitive to most people. Mm. Mm. Um, What is your advice around multi-day fasts or extended Mm. fasts? Yeah. I love them. I think if you do them right, they can really, really be life-changing. Um, I think three days is just fine unless you have some kind of chronic condition. Three days is a great, a great fasting length. You get all the benefits of that fasting can offer you. Um, I really like it for stem cell production. So since you have a very athletic audience, um, I would tell you that there is nothing that heals chronic musculoskeletal injuries like a three-day water fast. And here's why. 
when you hit that third day, you start making stem cells. Your body naturally makes stem cells. So stem cells will go to injured body parts and repair them and make them new again. You don't get stem cells. You know, once you start to get past 30, you're not getting any stem cells. You had a lot of stem cells as a baby. Mm -hmm. um, but you hear people say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm more, I, I have injuries that won't resolve. And usually they're in their thirties and, and older. Mm -hmm. So if you can go into a three-day water fast, uh, some people go in a little bit longer, you're going to get the stem cells surge. And it, the innate intelligence of the body will go and figure out where it will put those stem cells and will repair you. Mm. Did I catch? Did you catch me? I did. I, I did. I, for a it paused for did a little bit. Repair, repeat that? Okay. Maybe repeat it just in case. I think I got okay. it all, but go again. Okay. Yeah. No. So on that third day, stem cells come in and stem cells will go and repair any injured body part. So, you know, I don't know what it's like in Australia, but here in America, people are paying ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 for stem cells. Mm. And you can get yourself a stem cell surge by going three days or longer. Um, and it's, everybody does it a little different. Some people want to do musculoskeletal injury. Some people want to slow the aging process down. So, but stem cells are miraculous and we want lots of them. I love that. Um, what would someone expect the feeling of it? Like what, so let's say, well, let's not say, cause I haven't, I haven't done a three day fast. I think in way a long time ago, I've done, a, uh, I've definitely done 24 hours and I can't remember if I did much more than that, but what would what are my expectations when I'm going into my first um, three day fast? What are the do's and don'ts? Yeah, great question. Okay, so the first thing is stabilize your blood sugar before you go in. So if you go in eating the wrong fats in a high carbohydrate diet, yeah, it's going to be rough. I'm not going to lie. So the first thing you've got to do is you've got to pull out the harmful fats and pull out all the refined carbohydrates. This is define, like your, define to people what is what are harmful fats. Yeah, that's your canola oil, corn oil, cottonseed, soybean, partially hydrogenated, which I, I think they've outlawed, but I don't know. Um, and vegetable oils; those are mm. your biggies. And then um, the refined flours, your cakes, your pastas, your breads, your cookies, anything that is highly milled. Take those out. And then you're going to be, it's going to be so much easier to go into a three day fast. Mm -hmm. And so that's the first step. Second step is, a, and do that a couple of weeks leading up to the three day fast. By the time at that same point, what you want to do is start to take your eating window and compress it. So m get yourself pushing breakfast back. If you're not already fasting, push it back an hour every day. And then eventually, if you do that over two weeks, each day, there's another hour and then another hour, you're going to get to this place where four to six hours of eating, eating window is going to be easy. That usually takes about two weeks if you're fairly healthy. Then you're ready. When you can, you can do 20 hours of fasting really easily, you're ready for a three-day water fast. And that, at that point, you literally, it's just a jump in and, you, you know, you take your coffee out. I always tell people no coffee in those three days. Um, and you will, you will be amazed. The first day will feel okay. The second day will feel not okay. And the, it'll, you'll feel a little fatigued. You might feel a little dizzy. And then the third day you feel like somebody turned on a magic switch oh. inside your body and you will start to feel more mental, mentally clear. You'll start, I mean, you'll, you'll feel like you're dropping weight really quickly. Um, you'll move better. Your skin will change. I've seen eye color change. I've seen moles fall off people. Wow. Like it, the body by the third day goes into this highly like intelligent repair system. Now, if you want to go longer, I've seen people do seven days. I've seen people do 21 days. I highly recommend you're coached and, and somebody's helping mm. you through that. Yeah. <laughs> but, yes. but the longer you go, the body is so smart. What it will do is it will say, hey, you know what? No food's coming. I better clean myself up and get more efficient and more efficient. So it literally is like a doctor inside of you that looks around and says, 
Okay, the immune, here's some worn out white blood cells. Hey, here's a, an Achilles tendon that needs some stem cells. Okay, wait, the skin over here, it looks like this, the collagen in the skin is breaking down. We need to add some collagen over here. We've got some neurons in the brain that don't seem like they're firing right. Let's go ahead and pair those uh, uh, neurons. It, it's the most brilliant like healing experience that doesn't cost money that I have ever seen. This is the best. I'm going to, I'm going to make a statement right now. Oh, maybe I'll regret it. Maybe I'll regret it when this goes to air. <laughs> in, a, in a week, I'm doing a 28 day stop it, start it, quit it, change it free program for people where we're all just going to fix some shit up in our lives that we're not fixing up. So after that's done, I'm going to pick a date and I'm going to invite people to get on board and do a three day fast with me. Cause I feel like I need I feel like I need a crew with it. I feel like I'm going to need yeah. the emotional support. And that yeah. gives, us a, gives us a nice long five, six week window to sort our metabolic shit out to get into That's it. Right. So yeah. I'm excited about this. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. My other question is why the hell do, why is fasting not incorporated in our healthcare system? And further to that, yeah. why do I see people <laughs> in hospitals um, fighting diseases and cancers and, and, you know, immune system problems and getting fed utter shit from the medical system. Yeah. Oh, now you're, now you're, you've stepped into my mission. This is, <laughs> this upsets me so much. Mm. So, uh, when we first went into the pandemic here in uh, worldwide, but here in America, there was a statistic that came out that said 12% of Americans are metabolically fit which is atrocious. Wow. 80, 80, what that means is 82% of Americans are either overweight, have high blood pressure, or have uh, some kind of fatty liver uh, problem, and, or have a cardiovascular marker like cholesterol being high, uh, high LDLs, poor HDLs. 88% of Americans. Okay, now I don't know what it is in Australia, I think worldwide, it's literally about a third of our world because our horrific food is now infiltrated to the rest of the world. So we're looking at a metabolic crisis on our hands. Now, if you're a pharmaceutical company and each one of those conditions requires medication that you will never get off of, that you have to be on for the rest of your life, do you have any incentive to improve that person's health so they get off of the medication that is fueling your company? And I would say the answer legitimately, if we, I'd, I'd love to get in a conversation with the head of a pharmaceutical company, I would say the answer is no. There is no financial incentive. Okay, now to your point, let's go to the hospitals. Well, the hospitals, who backs them up? Who funds them? A lot of that is big pharma. Mm -hmm. You also have a hospital is a money making. I don't know what it's like in Australia, but here in America, it's another corporation that has to make money. If mm -hmm. I'm going to start serving organic food, if I'm going to have to start to like put like supplements on, on a patient's table, that's going to cost me a lot of money. So I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to feed them more of the poor Western diet. And that is going to lead to more medication, which I don't mind because I can make more money that way. And I know this sounds cynical, but it's not. This is why I'm so yeah. passionate about fasting is we can, okay, let's bypass this corporate greed. Let's go to the person who doesn't have the money to buy organic, who can't get to a functional health doctor to be able to repair their health. And let's just teach them how to compress their eating window. Mm. So if I could go into every hospital and I could start to get them to fast and get them to compress that eating window, we would get them off the medications and we would get them out of the hospital quicker than what big pharma and big food are doing for them in that hospital setting. But there's so here in America, there's so many lobbyists, there's so many politicians tied into that. It's a very difficult mountain to climb. Mm, gets me super fired up. Yep, super me too. Fired up. A yep. couple of last questions, because um, I can't just keep you here for a week. Sadly, very <laughs> sad. But you know, it's been amazing. Um, one question is just think. I was just um, mulling over what we talked about before in terms of the female cycle. Is it is it better to, if we were to, 
Is it better for someone to just go hard on fasting and not follow a cycle or is it better to not fast at all? So obviously the optimum is track your 30-day cycle and fast appropriately given what day you're on. Mm. But if it was too fast or not to fast at all, what's the better option there? Uh, it's a it's a it's a tough dilemma. That's a tough one. But I I would say fasting is going to be better. Um, and I let me tell you why. And I use I'll use myself as an example. When I found fasting, I w- I fell in love with it, and I fell in love with how I felt. Mm. And so I didn't know about fasting to my cycle. I was forty five years old. I was in my perimenopausal years. Pretty quickly, I started noticing my period was going away, like my hair was changing, but I, my mind felt amazing. My Mm. weight was where I wanted it. Mm. Um, So I just thought I was going into menopause. I didn't really think much about it. And then I ran a hormone test on myself and I saw that all my hormones had tanked. So I was able to modify and that's how I, you know, a large part of how I came up with the fasting cycle that we talked about. But I tell you that to say, even in all of that, I had at 45, better mental clarity, better stamina, better energy. I wasn't falling asleep at three in the afternoon. I had Mm. so many more benefits than when I was eating all day. So if we had to make the decision, I would say yes, fast more. Um, But then now we have resources to be able to do it around our cycle. I love that. And I think this is my last question. Uh, Are there any supplements or medications to that we can take without interrupting the um, process of fasting and I guess including autophagy. Yeah. Uh, so autophagy is a little quicker or a little, a little more complicated um, because we don't know what's going to like, you know, autophagy when nutrients come in, like this is the question about the BCAAs. It's like, well, when amino acids come in, if the cell senses an influx of nutrition, it may turn off autophagy. Mm. So I think we have to be a little bit careful with how many supplements if you're trying to get that real autophagy effect. But it won't affect ketosis, so you can still take them to get ketosis. Having said all of that, there are some supplements that I really, really recommend that people look at, and here here are the two categories. One is we've got to add in minerals. So because you're not bringing in nutrition, especially if you're fasting a lot, we've got to bring in magnesium, potassium, and sodium. So if you fast and you notice your heart is racing or your hair is changing, or if you notice that your muscles are breaking down more than you want, even if you do the hack I taught earlier, try adding in sodium, potassium, and magnesium because these are key minerals we need. Again, I hope your guys' soils are better than ours, but in America, we've monocropped and all of our soils are so deficient of mm-hmm. minerals that most of the people I see are mineral deficient and then they fast and they're now even more mineral deficient. Mm. So you want to add in minerals, no doubt. The second thing, and this is kind of a new one that I've been really going into and excited about, actually, the, and I'll put it under two categories. One is hydrogen water. I don't know what you know about hydrogen water. I don't know anything about it. So I'm all ears. And there's like hydrogen tablets you can put in water that will pull the hydrogen out. The reason that this is really interesting is that hydrogen can actually kill the hunger hormone. So it will actually turn off the hunger hormone so you're not hungry and it will repair the microbiome so that the bacteria in your gut start communicating better. Wow. So if, you, if you've been on lots of antibiotics, if you've been on a lot of birth control pills for your life, then you've got a depleted gut. So in that fasted state, if you are drinking hydrogen water, you can really bring back the health of your microbiome. And so you're double stacking again, uh, the benefits of fasting on the microbiome with the hydrogen water, and you can really repair your gut. Oh, you are the best. Doc. <laughs> I am so excited I found you. I, this has Thank honestly you. exceeded my expectations. You have delivered mm. so, like definitely the best um, information on the stuff that I've spent half my life seeking lately and mm. really not getting the clarity that I wanted around it. So I just want to say thank you so much oh, my for coming pleasure. on to chat. What, what, um, what are you offering in terms of service and where can people find you? Cause I know that right now they've got Google out and they're going, who's this chick? Where do I, how do I get to her? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. You're so sweet. And I want to also push some kudos to you because you ask great questions. I could sit and chat with you all day too. <laughs> well, and you're welcome I, back. You'll, in fact, you'll probably <laughs> be you. stalked at some point. <laughs> I, I love it. And I'd love to help you through your three-day water fast. So always feel free to reach out to me and if you need some extra support there. Oh, I will. Um, you can go to my website, drmindypels.com. Uh, my YouTube channel is where I really try to bring the, the science of fasting. And then I'm really excited about my book will come out in the end of 22, Fast Like a Girl. So, Well, I'm, I'm down for that book. I am eagerly awaiting grabbing a copy of that. I'll have all of the, um, all of the access to you in the show notes. And I'm hoping like hell I can convince you to come back at some point soon. Oh, I would love to. Yeah. And you know what I'll do is I'll, I'll come back when, when like in the fall 